for this evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Tony Madgwick. He's the lead investigator on the Bees in the City project, which he's going to discuss with us, and that's funded by the Quintin Hogg Trust. He's a graduate in zoology. He worked briefly as an entomologist with the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food before embarking on an academic career in biomedical science. He is a passionate amateur entomologist whenever his time allows, specialising in damselflies, bees and wasps. And he's one of the fantastic number of recorders that we have in the London Natural History Society. He's the bees and wasps recorder and I'm really delighted that he's going to share a lot with some of his great expertise with us tonight. So I'm going to hand you over to Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you for the committee to, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, you've built me up tremendously. I hope I can deliver <laughs> on, on what you've actually said so far. Uh, can I just check that you're seeing the full view and not my uh, speaker's notes? Not no, it's fine. It's perfect. There. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, well, a quick overview, I suppose. I'll start off by talking a little bit about not just the university, but the way this project came into being and why we think it's important. I'll talk a little bit about solitary bees and social bees, um, but there's an awful lot I can say about that that can't fit into this talk. So we'll, we'll skate over bits. And if you want to ask questions towards the end, by all means, ask me. And I notice there's some other experts in the, in the audience as well. So there'll be plenty of expertise to, to deliver on this. Then I'll talk about the project itself. And of course, the important bit perhaps is how you can get involved if you wish to get involved uh, in the work that we're doing. So a bit about the university, the University of Westminster, one of the old polytechnics, probably one of the oldest in the country. It's been around since 1838 in various guises. So it's a, an ancient institution in that sense. We have a wide range of, of nationalities represented amongst our almost 20,000 students and a variety of different interests and uh, departments involved in various aspects of both science, arts, architecture, the usual gamut of, of subject areas that universities deal with. Once upon a time, it used to have an environmental science course. And as many of you, I noticed that the age range will know, environmental sciences, biological sciences in natural history suffered a terrible culling um, certainly since I was an undergraduate doing a zoology degree and unfortunately the environmental science component was one of those things that was lost from this university a great shame but as but elsewhere we're all looking at trying to find ways of bringing it back into our curriculum um, one of the sort of important things about the university is that we have a large number of students who don't necessarily have an interest an understanding observational abilities or, or even the awareness of what goes on around them in their environment and it became obvious in discussions with students both in lectures and in tutorials and also in general discussion corridors that there was this lack of awareness despite the fact that we had plenty of opportunities to observe different types of insect um, on the campus and around the campus despite being in an inner city environment and asking a question for example and I, I'm not going to put a poll up don't panic everybody but if I was to ask you, what if actually are you seeing here? Are there any bees present in this, this field of view? I mean, some people will probably recognise the fact that, that maybe this, this little califorid here, this, this green bottle is not a, not a bee. But some of the others, well, they might think these are wasps, for example. This has a certain bee-like uh, uh, characteristic, as does this one. Because the only bee in the field is this little male colletes over here sitting on the ivy. The rest of them are hoverflies and, and one of the California flies as well. And that difference, just understanding and looking at the difference between these different types of insects and recognising the characteristics, the typical of a fly, so you've got this large, large waist, the big eyes, two, one pair of wings, pair of halters, make them very different from the bees. We can't really see it very well here, but you've got two pairs of wings, you've got smaller eyes, you've got a long antenna as opposed to a short antenna in the fly. These little observational details are, are quite important in, in terms of developing scientific skills and observational skills in our students. So there seems to be a, a real area of, of potential exploration to, to look at how we can engage students with looking at the environment around them and giving them a real focus, but also pulling that into the kind of work they were doing in their studies. 
And of course, ask most people what the main bee around is, and everybody points straight away to the, the honeybee. I put the urban honeybee here. It's a controversial area at the moment. I'm sure we've had talks in the past and we'll have talks in the future about the role of the honeybee, uh, particularly in city areas, particularly as it becomes very fashionable to, to put up hives in as many places as possible and have them in gardens on tops of roofs of tall buildings and so on. So we have large numbers of honeybees around in the city, but they're quite different from the bees I'm interested in which are the solitary bees, the wild bees, and we'll come on to more details of that in a moment. But the, the honeybees are typically these have these cylindrical bodies, uh, these nice sort of hooked antennae, which are very sort of classic in their size as well. But also, if you get up close and personal to a honeybee, you notice it has these uniquely hairy eyes, which no other bee has, which is a great way of being able to discriminate between honeybees and other bees. And also encouraging people to get close, but not too close, because we don't want to encourage them uh, to, to get stung. A lot of bees seen around in the, in the city that I have reported to me on a regular basis, because they're big and they're obvious and they're, they're colorful and, they're popular, they're, they're furry, they're cute. A lot of people will actually report on them. So for example, over here we have um, the red-tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius, quite a large chunky bee, along with the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus terrestris. But of course, we also have our common carder bee, Bombus pasquorum, which is quite commonly seen, probably one of the most common bees, certainly in my area in East London. And then the newly emerging bee, since 2001, this bee has been colonised in the UK, which is Bombus hypnorum, or the white-tailed, or the tree bumblebee, rather. When, and this is a bee that's being reported to me on a regular basis uh, all over all over London, but again, particularly in my area of East London. These are bees that form colonies. They're not social bees in the sense that a honeybee is a social bee, but they have they form colonies of between up to 500 individuals in the case of, uh, uh, of the buff tails and about 100 to 150 in the case of these smaller carder bees. So they're quite large populations. They have a social interaction between them. Uh, they're well studied, but importantly, as far as I'm concerned, with the exception of the tree bumblebee, by definition, these are ground nesting bees. So these are usually found in the ground, in lawns uh, and, and in other areas, uh, um, in part, cities, parks and gardens. Um, there are, for some reason, my slide hasn't worked. Underneath this one, there is actually, there are a number of uh, different bee types, because I was trying to emphasize the fact that there are two, nearly 270 different wild bees in the UK, the majority of which are, inverted commas, uh, solitary. Although some of them will actually nest together in colonies, um, although with independent nests in those colonies, unlike the bumblebees and the honeybees that have a simple hive or a nest uh, in which all the bees congregate. Um, some bees will actually have uh, rather interesting eusocial organisations where there'll be a common entranceway, uh, but a number of chambers that run off from that being occupied by different bees, this kind of eusocial uh, collective that sometimes emerges with some solitary bees, particularly the ground nesting bees. But these two bees, um, are they two bees? In fact, this is one bee. This is Anthrophora, plu Anthrophora plumipes, or the hairy-footed flower bee. And on the left, we have the male with the hairy feet, as it were, uh, and quite distinctive yellow face. And everybody was in the meeting beforehand. I think David Howden had a picture of one of these uh, in his background. This is the male, and this is the female. The female, all dark. So this is the sexual dimorphism that's typical of, of this group of bees, the Anthrophorids. But um, these are really early spring bees that are commonly appear uh, in, in cities in particular because they like to nest in loose mortar. And they're the bees that we find burrowing their way into chimney breasts and appearing in people's homes. And I've come to the fore as being a point of contact and a point of interest for a number of individuals. And one thing I do find is that I often see these bees and they're often reported and they say, well, where's the nest? And they're very, very often very difficult to find because they are high up on rooftops uh, and the chimney breasts. And rarely do we see them actually uh, in obvious places on, on buildings. Although locally to us uh, in Wanstead, we have one house uh, and the entire front of the house, it's been unoccupied for quite a while, is an absolute haven full of these nesty sites where the bees are burrowing into the mortar between the bricks. And you see masses of these bees flying around. And of course, where there is neglect, these bees thrive. Where there is less neglect, um, they tend to do a little less well. <laughs> 
Um, unfortunately, underneath this slide, I've also got some other examples of bees, but it was just to show the variation in size. So these bees are about a centimetre in size, whereas the smaller bees can be less than you know, five millimetres in size. And the smallest bee, Chelostoma campanularum, which is the uh, small scissor bee, is only about four millimetres long and not often seen. And these important bees, frequent in occurrence, but often overlooked or mistaken for flies. So this is one area to try and encourage people to think about the types of bees they're seeing in their gardens, to look more closely at what they're seeing on their flowers foraging. So why should we be interested in bees and why in particular should we actually develop any studies? Well, we all know, and particularly those of you who saw Jeff Ollerton's talk recently with the LNHS, they're important uh, pollinators. And in particular, the wild bees, the solitary bees, uh, are often overlooked publicly as being important pollinators of our native flora uh, and also um, and fruit trees and so on. Um, probably more important than the honeybee in many ways because um, they have a different way of actually pollinating, which again I think Jeff talked about uh, quite a bit last time. But here on the left we see the typical sort of nice meadows that are appearing all over the city at the moment. These are on Hackney marshes with a stone's throw of high-rise buildings. And this is an area that's full of bees and we can see them often flying from flower to flower carrying pollen and it gives us an opportunity to actually look at the foraging habits and assess the types of bees that are actually in our locality. It's a rather difficult way of actually seeing them in the sense we have to actually catch them and look at them uh, or get up close and personal to identify them because bee identity, as I'll show, show in a moment, is not always the easiest of, of um, occupations. Um, partly because they're small, but partly because the differences between certain types of bees are actually very small. Uh, we're looking at differences in hairs, uh, colours of hairs, um, the, the patterning we find on the chitin of the, of the thorax and of the abdomen, for example. And these two bees also show different ways of pollinating. Uh, this is um, a Panergus, a very small black bee that's often found, particularly in our area, the acid grasslands. Wonderful little bee. You often find the males curled up in flowers. And as the, as the flowers close, as the night draws in or the evening draws in, they nestle inside those, those flower heads. This is a female collecting pollen. You can see she's collecting pollen on her legs and that and also she has a large number of hairs across her body which will pick up pollen and that will be taken across and transferred to other flowers as she moves. Uh, the brown on the surface is actually mud because this is one of the burrowing bees, this is a ground nesting bee. Here we have um, uh, Heriodes truncorum, which is another type of bee which carries pollen, especially or um, uh, hairs on her lower abdomen. And she'll again carry her uh, uh, pollen back to the nest and that pollen will be used for feeding grubs that are going to grow up to ultimately into adults. But the important thing about these bees compared with say honeybees for example is these are dry pollinators so they pick up their pollen in a dry attached by electrostatic uh, attraction uh, to their to their hairs um, and as a consequence although they can collect a large amount of pollen a lot of it will also be transferred and moved as they move from flower to flower which makes them relatively efficient pollinators. Honeybees on the other hand will add a little bit of nectar to the pollen to make a, a solid mass which they stick onto their hind legs and those will be carried around and with relative efficiency as far as pollen gathering is concerned and foraging but these make it a relatively poor uh, mechanism for transferring pollen. So our wild bees, the point I'm trying to make, are very important pollinators uh, in, in our local environments. That's not to exclude others so the various flies and small beetles and pollen beetles and, and other insects flying between flowers also act to help with pollination. But so there's a wide variety, a wide diversity of insects involved in the process of pollination. So obviously the consequence of um, uh, pollination means there's always a lot of interest in uh, pollinators in terms of food production, particularly fruit, for example. And of course, those of you who are gardeners and growing uh, various uh, um, plants or, or, or pollinated, uh, insect pollinated uh, um, plants, 
derived giving rise to food products in your gardens will be very interested in this. But for us, the other interesting thing about bees is, of course, one, their biodiversity, the large diversity of different types of bees that can be found, the different behaviours, and also the fact they emerge at different times of the year, coinciding with different cycles of pollination that might be going on uh, within the, the local area. But also it's a question of whether they're an indicator of habitat qualities and the quality of our local environments. And we know quite clearly when I've seen over the last few years that although diversity hasn't particularly changed, we're still seeing a wide range of different species. The actual instance, the numbers of most bees seems to be declining. On the other hand, others are increasing. So we see an increase in the tree bumblebee, for example, but some other bees seem to be becoming less frequently seen or overlooked, depending on their size and their habits. I put this bit in as well, because particularly with COVID-19, the one thing I have noticed in my conversations with so many people is this, uh, that we will come across the idea of mindfulness, the fact that we're using nature to perhaps uh, relieve our stresses and strains associated with, um, with COVID-19 and, and isolation through COVID-19. And a lot of people are spending time either looking at birds or recruiters. I think there's been recent things about nocturnal migrations, another means of, of trying to uh, uh, dist distract from the problems of COVID-19 isolation. But going out into gardens, into parks, and watching bees has become another way of, of engaging with nature and thinking about uh, the, the natural world around us. And it's an important hook for many people to, to get them interested in, in what happens in our local and urban environments. So I'm kind of getting onto the topic of where bees live and what they do, and that sort of leads us onto the project that we're interested in. Bees live either in the ground, as I've hinted at, or they're aerial nesters. Ground nesters, and this is a, an example of Colotes hedri or the ivy bee, um, are ground nesters. They'll, they'll make burrows in mud. You often see them in large colonies in lawns and banks. Uh, and they spend most all their time, uh, well, they build their nest cells uh, underground. And that's where they, uh, uh, um, the, the bees will be delivering their foraged pollen uh, to create cells within these underground tunnels uh, to raise their young. And depending on the type of bee, they'll actually select areas that contain mud or sand or lawns. Um, the <laughs> Mary's attempts to try and encourage these kind of ground nesters to, to nest in particular places, but it's often quite difficult to encourage them into your gardens or, or elsewhere. Um, they tend to be very particular about the soil, the soil quality in order to encourage them to actually produce, uh, uh, create nests or nesting colonies. Many of these bees are colonial nesters, but there are others that are individual nesters that choose very out of the way places that you quite difficult to find sometimes. Um, the other type of uh, um, habitat or, or, or nesting habitat that bees use are those who use the aerial nesting habits. So they'll use trees. I mentioned anthophora plumipes in terms of living in uh, burrows in mortar. But deadwood, brambles and grass stalks are three interesting areas you'll often find bees. This is my favourite tree on uh, should I say where it is? <laughs> it's in one. This is in Wanstead Park, and it's a lovely old tree that's seen better days. But it's probably one of the most exciting little areas to go and spend some time watching bees because you can see how they're interacting with the, with the with with the uh, um, the dying tree that as it rots away. Uh, I'll come on to that in a moment. But also, we see bees that will nest in brambles, in dead brambles, in grass stalks. They form very small, very out of the way, very uh, uh, difficult to find sites for nesting. But going back to my tree, so for example, when you look at trees, when you look at the surface of trees, you often see lots and lots of holes. These are the exit holes from uh, various wood boring beetles that have exited at some point in time. And then you'll find often, particularly in the spring and at different times of the summer, you'll see different bees in succession not just bees, there'll also be wasps and other, other insects as well, but the bees in particular occupying these nest holes. This is an example of a leafcutter bee that's actually um, occupying a rather larger hole or one that's enlarged itself. And some of these smaller holes will actually be occupied by the much smaller bees, in this case, Hylius communis, the common uh, yellow-faced bee. And this tiny little bee, it's only four to five millimetres long, will occupy some of those smaller holes. And one point about both of these bees is that they will actually also 
Occupy B hotels. And that's really useful uh, phenomenon for us because unlike ground nesters and other types of bees, uh, we can actually put up bee hotels and attract bees into our gardens, into our local areas, if we want to actually watch them, study them and see what they're doing. And this is, of course, an entire industry has grown up over this. So you can find numerous different types of so-called bee hotel, bee house. Uh, but the feature of all of them is that they contain some kind of hollowed out stem or hollowed out environment, which is not too damp, not too dry, is breathable. And if you choose the right situation, usually a south facing wall at around about sort of head height for the average person, these will actually be colonized by any bees that might be around, provided there is suitable forage nearby within this range uh, for the females to actually uh, transport pollen from the forage areas back to these nest sites. And they'll actually produce cells um, containing an egg, which will grow into a grub and they will fill up these tubes, starting with the females and then ending up with a few male eggs at the end. So you get females being laid first or what will become females first. Then the next eggs that are laid become the males. An important area because often enough I've found with my uh, bee hotels in my garden, nearly every single one of them was, was occupied by one or other species of bee. And all of them have been predated by um, blue tits or great tits, not quite sure which because I never see them doing it. Um, and you can see that the male cells towards the end have all gone or some of them. There are some, but deeper down where the birds can't reach, there'll be a couple of males left, and perhaps some females as well for the next season. So those sacrificial males in the outside of the bee hotels are quite important from that point of view. And that applies to other predators and, and parasites, as I'll show you in a moment. But here you can see two different types of bee occupying the ones in my garden. So this is uh, um, Osmia carolescens or the blue mason bee, and this is uh, the red mason bee, Osmia bicornis. Two very common in our area bees that occupy and readily uh, enter into bee hotels. And this is uh, the Osmia carolescens, the blue mason bee. This is a female, beautiful little bee if you can get up close and personal probably best take a photograph to see it in all its glory. Um, but these are steely blue in color. The males are slightly different. They're slightly steely green. So quite, quite different in many respects, but these are wonderful little bees that, that will occupy your, your bee hotels. However, there are other um, interesting things that uh, uh, intercept some of these bees as they occupy those hotels. This is Sapica quinquipunctata, which is actually a wasp that will actually oviposit um, uh, an egg into a cell. And you'll often see these hanging around your bee hotels. Um, and they're waiting for an opportunity to go in and lay an egg in the cell as the cells are being formed by the, um, uh, um, by the bees. Those eggs will hatch. The larva has huge, well, relatively large jaws, and the larva of the of the wasp will eat the egg, and then proceed to to um, uh, consume the pollen that's been placed in the cell, but which was originally intended for the the bee grub, uh, which then obviously becomes the wasp ultimately. All sorts of interesting thing points about these uh, um, paras parasites and parasitoids, or these are kleptoparasites in fact, um, is that they actually occupy the outermost cells very often. There's always that question as to how and when they emerge and how that inter interacts with the, with the bees uh, that will be emerging later on uh, from those tubes. And that takes us on to another subject which is really interesting, which is how they time their emergence when these bees are living in the dark in a relatively stable temperature environment. Um, but that's a subject I'm sure for another talk. Um, here's another common bee that's found uh, in our, 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 um, uh, our bee hotels, which is Osmia bicornis or the red mason bee. You can't see it very well, but there are actually a couple of horns on this female, hence the name bicornis, which she uses to pack down um, the, the uh, um, uh, uh, mud that she uses to um, um, block the or create the, the nest cells within the tubes. Um, very common, these often occupy large numbers, uh, or we find large numbers of these uh, in suitable environments and suitably large uh, bee hotels. Although in the wild, the, they don't tend to be quite so uh, densely uh, uh, nest, nest in such dense colonies. 
I mentioned the fact there are about 270 old bee species, but of course species uh, diversity changes is dynamic, particularly in these days of, of global warming. And I think, again, Jeff Olson mentioned this, I think last in the last talk. And Osmia cornuta, the orchard mason bee or European mason bee is a bee that's beginning to appear uh, more regularly um, in parts of London. So we do see a change in the types of bees that, that we see occupying uh, the habitats of, of our urban areas. Another bee that you might well find in your um, uh, bee hotels is are the mega cars, the leaf cutter bees. This is Willoughby's leaf cutter bee, which is one of the most common ones. Uh, with these wonderful, the males have these wonderful boxing gloves on their front legs, which are very distinctive. <laughs> one of the rare, rare opportunities to get a distinctive male, to be quite honest. And I know those of you who are interested in bees or have perhaps tried to identify bees will realize that males, particularly Andrinas, the ground nesting bees, can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. But those point I was making about the complexities of actually recognising different species of bees. Um, here are two more, Megacal centuncularis and Lignocica. These are very similar looking bees when you actually look at them in the wild. Uh, and when they're flitting past you, and these are very active bees, they're fast moving when they're pollinating and often go through a buzz pollination phase. So they're raggling their um, uh, abdomens uh, and being very, very active, which makes it very difficult to see some of the important features that separate one species from another. Um, species differentiation might often be down to simply the hairs on the tip of the abdomen, the color of the pollen brush on the abdomen as well. And so that's covered with pollen. It makes it very difficult to discriminate between different species of bees and we'll come on to why that's important in a moment. So coming to heading towards the point of this or the idea of the project of course we end up with lots of discussions about bees in the city and here are two examples of bees that we find actually in our campus in Fitzrovia. and this is on a on the third floor of an enclosed area which has um, is surrounded by buildings which are up to five stories high. And in that enclosed area, you have a, an area with, with lots of lavender, and then a few herbs that have been planted in planters. And despite this rather unforgiving and poor uh, uh, forage site, we actually find lots of interesting bees and wasps appearing. This is one Alessio Glossum morio which was actually uh, um, feeding on one of the, the herbs. And this was actually a, a video, but I'm not going to play it. Um, the bee, the, well, that's a wasp there, Ancestrosaurus, one of the potter wasps. And then if the video had played on, you'd have seen uh, a red-tailed bumblebee come through, several honeybees come through. Uh, and so you get a mixture of the larger, high-flying, powerful flyers, like the, the, the bigger bees, but also some of the smaller bees and wasps are able to make their way into these very unlikely environments which raises all sorts of questions about how they move around and, and do their stuff and get into these places. So this discussion resulted, or this observa these observations resulted in discussions with the Environmental Society, and in particular one individual, which is Dane, became really interested in what we do with bees. And she was at that time, the president of the uh, Students' Union's Environmental Society. And as a result of that, we started to hatch the Bitsy project, the Bees in the City project, to ask some real questions about what bees are doing in cities, but also linking that in, particularly with those of us working in biological and biomedical sciences, to find ways of putting our skills and, and interests in, and projects involving uh, um, uh, other, our scientific methodologies into some kind of project linking in with the environment, but also being inter intersectional in the sense that we could start to bring in other individuals from other departments and other disciplines to, to see what we were doing. So our main aim was to explore some factors that impact on wild bee populations in London. Nothing particularly unique in that. A lot of other people are doing similar kinds of work. But obviously being an educational institution with an outreach brief was to promote research and education projects on species diversity, ecology, and also health, which is an area of interest for those of us like myself who are involved in biomedical science. Our objectives were design, build, and monitor bee hotels and trying to design hotels that could be monitored relatively easily, manufactured easily, could be standardized, and we could use and cite to actually effectively act as 
not traps in the best sense of the word to pull bees in that we could then look at and observe and then follow some of the um, various commensals, parasites and parasitoids that might be um, in, uh, associated with those bees. And using particularly environmental DNA and RNA techniques to try and, and, and see what's there without causing too much of an impact on the bees that we're, we're seeing. We also were interested in exploring some technological solutions and remote modeling. Um, particular interest of us, of course, is the interaction between bees, particularly in bee hotels, and the various parasites and parasitoids that may be visiting those health hotels. So the one thing we do notice is that when you have larger populations of bees close together, obviously that pulls in many, many more predators uh, on a regular basis. And it's interesting to look at the strategies that these bees are actually adopting to avoid parasitism and parasitoidism. The other important thing about this was using our students as co-creators to help us with this process. So we actually put the call out, not just to scientists, but architects and designers to think about the, the bee hotels, uh, engineers and mathematicians to help us with the modeling, photographers, artists, and media students to help us actually develop uh, an outreach process that would help us to um, engage with, with, with other people and pull them into the environmental uh, um, excitement that's associated with this kind of work. So it's essentially pushing out the outreach and engaging everybody in citizen science wherever possible. And we were lucky enough to put in a grant to the Quinton Hogg Trust and they've given us some money to do this, which is really exciting. Um, so back to bee hotels, and I think those of you who've seen my talk before or talks before may recognise this is this, and I've taken this one of Stephen Falk's pictures, and I forgot to put his name on it. But here you can actually see another interesting um, assemblage of environments, and you can see that you've got the, the rotting logs typical of the normal environment for many of these uh, 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 aerial bees, the ones that actually use holes in wood to, to nest. And then the more artificial elements containing these various types of bee hotels. And you can see that some of these are typical commercial versions versus those that, that, that maybe have been manufactured by oneself. You can see there's actually some wire netting over that to stop bird predation as well. These are great, but the question is, are these do these mirror what we normally see in, in normal populations and normal assemblages of, of bees? And if you remember that picture I showed you of my tree trunk in Wanstead Park, you could argue it's very similar to this, a very dense concentration of various species of bees occupying different niches, different size or different diameter holes within the wood. But of course, when you're starting to create sort of things like this, which are have a certain element of um, uh, uh, um, what I'm looking for, the resilience, they, they'll last a certain length of time before they'll start to break down. The tree trunk is going to die and fall away as saprophytes begin to, to destroy it. And then the, the bees will have moved on to other sites. But very often when people are creating these kinds of environments, they'll persist for years um, or month, months or years, depending on, on how well they're looked after. So the question for us is what kind of bee hotels and assemblage of bee hotels uh, are most effective in attracting bees and keeping them uh, uh, in that place? And uh, as a consequence, what kind of uh, or what kind of uh, parasitism or predation do they suffer as a consequence of that concentration? Um, how is it best to actually cite them? How is it best to make them work? Where should they be placed? And of course, for us, is how best to monitor them as well. So can we actually generate um, bee hotels that can uh, um, allow us to remotely monitor comings and goings and look at the activity associated with them. And where should we put them? The University of Westminster is fortunate in fact we have a central London area or campuses. We also have a more remote, remote, sorry those people who'd be like, but remote to us from central London out in Harrow. Northwick Park and we also have our Chiswick sports ground but on the Thames which has a lot of open space around it. So we actually have some quite contrasting urban sites just associated with uh, our student population but of course what we need to do and what we'd like to do is to get as many uh, areas involved as possible with people monitoring bee hotels and, and both 
artificial created by us and also any sites occupied by bees in other areas to look to see what kind of populations we have and as we'll see in a moment also to assess what kind of, of particularly bacterial and viral loads they may be carrying because of course this sort of region or area we know that there are lots and lots of honey bee hives in 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 these areas uh, and mapping that against forage might actually be an important way for us to look at the competition that may exist between wild bees and solitary bees another important thing that we have been considering so what are we going to do what do you want to know we want to know what bees are colonizing the hotels it's quite difficult to monitor bee hotels constantly and particularly if you've got a population that are only beginning to learn to discriminate between different types of bees it's not always easy to identify them from photographs so finding out finding a way of uh, identifying them through dna dna barcoding is certainly one area we're exploring this also allows us to look at the genetic diversity of local populations and this could actually potentially allow us to look at uh, uh, dispersion and dispersion patterns in bees um, this is more of a long-term aim as one might expect and we also want to look at the the types of parasitic and clapped parasitic penvertebrates that might be Im impacting on the reproductive potential the ability of these colonies or individuals to survive and and, and recolonize and restock re, uh, other areas. We also want to look at the assessment of the bacterial and viral loads of the nest. We know from uh, reports that come elsewhere that generally wild bee populations are thought to contain slightly lower viral loads than honeybees, for example. And of course, there is an interaction between uh, the virus on bacteria carried by honeybees and how they may what, what the interaction is between commercial or farmed or domestic honeybees versus the wild bee populations in our in our in our in our urban environment bearing in mind as i mentioned before this apparent uh, reduction in numbers that we see not necessarily in species and I say looking at this inter interspecies pathogen transmission where if we can by looking and tracking the types of virus and bacteria found in bee populations in terms of our outreach of course this gives us a brilliant opportunity to get students and the general public wherever possible involved in understanding insects in general and bees in particular and developing new they're giving them new skills and encouraging them to actually think about what's happening in their environments and what the futures might be and also of course giving uh, individuals uh, um, opportunities uh, themselves to become involved in transmission of that information and there have been many, many talks and many, uh, um, certainly I've had so many uh, individuals and groups come to me and I know they've gone to other people as well, looking for information and looking for ways to encourage bees in their local areas. And very often bees means honeybees or bees means bumblebees. Um, but it's just trying to encourage people to think much more widely than, than the, the, the obvious uh, uh, bee species. So going back to morphological idea or looking at identifying uh, bees, do we actually look at shapes or do we look at DNA barcoding? So usually species ID is being relatively straightforward. If you just look at something, you can identify it. However, often some of those distinguishing features are hidden or difficult to see uh, or maybe very subtle between closely related species and of course as we increasingly realize that some species may uh, show signs of polymorphism uh, and there may also be um, cryptic species lurking amongst them we do see that with with some of the bomb the, the bomber species for example and it's always been well recognized in butterflies and in birds and also <laughs> as we know to our cost at the moment in viruses as well so for example you may well see um, you, uh, these kind of um, you'll see a various patterns perhaps in the wings of butterflies that look very very similar but actually if you look at their genetic makeup the barcoding that we find in, in these, these particular butterflies we can actually discriminate between different species on the basis of molecular markers and the same is true for example of birds as well birds that appear to be very similar and yet have often reported to have different slightly different behaviors and I, I'm, I'm hesitant here because I realize there are lots of birders in the in the audience I'm sure they'll get me for this but um, uh, it, it can sometimes be very difficult to discriminate between very closely related species that show tremendous phenotypic similarities but may show 
um, slightly more subtle differences. And in bees, you've got very small creatures with very, basically you have to have them in the hand and a magnifying lens to separate them. So have you got another means of discriminating between them? And the way to do that would be to look at barcoding, to look at the sequences, the actual, the four letter code that actually determines the genetic makeup of the uh, uh, bee. And we can extract DNA um, from dead bees, possibly, but certainly from their environments, and I'll talk about in a moment. We can then amplify the signal, if you like, from these little bits of DNA that we've extracted. We can sequence them and then hopefully identify which species are present based on the sequences that, that are found in our samples. In most cases, we, well, in not all cases, we'll be able to do that because they, we may need uh, voucher specimens to actually compare the sequences, the codes with uh, the insects themselves. But a lot of that's now being done elsewhere. And I know other groups are heavily involved in this. Uh, the environmental DNA aspect, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but essentially, if we can look at the DNA that's found within the tubes, within um, the uh, our uh, um, bee hotels, we should be able to pick out what's actually present or has been associated with, with those bee hotels. I, I, there, there are some issues with this and I appreciate that. So for example, if you're, if you're removing the environmental DNA from the tube that's in a bee hotel, you know, how much of that is from pollen has been imported from the, by the bee? How much of that is incidental? How much of it is actually targeted at the bee? But certainly by taking DNA and amplifying them up using either uh, classical or quantitative PCR. We can actually follow up with either uh, complete sequencing of the genes and comparing them uh, um, with uh, recognized sequences on databases, or we can actually uh, target particular taxa by using specific um, um, you know, short uh, uh, lengths of, of, of DNA to actually identify what might be what is present if we suspect uh, particular bee types or other type of insect associated with those uh, bee hotels. And we have our own genomics facility We're run by Dr. Nadesh Pheno, who, and so we have the, the ability to actually run these kinds of comparisons within the university. So it makes it a little bit more easy than sending away as most people have to at the moment. We have a uh, Professor um, uh, uh, Isaac Kale, who runs um, one of our important uh, machine learning and biomechanical engineering departments, has a big interest in automated species identification. Those of you who are familiar with um, um, some of the online apps that will allow identification uh, will, will be familiar with this. Um, but again, using AI for determining what bees may be entering or leaving our bee hotels is a really exciting area of exploration. And it may not necessarily be on shape. There are other aspects that are really interesting in the way that bees uh, um, can, be, can be discriminated. Those of you who've actually sat or spent any time around bees will recognize that the larger bees, probably not the smaller ones, they often sound different. And it may well be that we can look at behavioural changes, and behavioural sound um, as bees approach their, their nest sites it may help us to discriminate between different bees as they go in and out, allowing us to take remote measurements and assess what's actually happening in our bee hotels. And also hopefully discriminating between those that live in those hotels and those that are there to, to lay eggs in, in the, the various tubes. So we can actually begin to study and understand behaviour from that point of view. Um, and using any dynamic trace scenarios so we can actually start to use machine learning to model behavior as well. So this is an exciting area of, of um, research that we're hoping to embark, well we will be embarking on very soon. The other important area which I think I know has a lot of interest um, and we're certainly interested in it from, from a number of different reasons is actually screening for viruses and bacteria in solitary bees uh, within our bee hotels. Um, again I'm not going into too much detail, we know a lot about or you can hear a lot about the diseases affecting um, uh, honeybees and I think there are a number of problems at the moment with our hives in London and there's a question now as to where and how these viruses and bacteria bacteria being transmitted, distributed uh, between our wild bee population and also our hive bee population as well. And whether this is having an impact on their one behaviour, two population density and, and I suppose finally uh, diversity as well. <laughs> 
And again, we have a number of techniques we can actually use to look at both DNA and RNA viruses. And we have a, an, an exciting team of scientists who, who are, are preparing uh, to do this work. So how can you get involved? Well, if you're going to interested in putting up B hotels, and I recognize there's an interesting debate to be had here, because by encouraging hotels and putting up B hotels to bring bees in, um, you may well be influencing the local environment. And of course, color, what one also needs to think about is forage. And this is a debate I think that's going on outside. And I've had quite a few individuals talking about this, which is planting for planting for bees, planting for forage, and making sure appropriate forage is, is around. And there's no point in putting a bee hotel up in your garden if all you've got is grass and the, all your local neighbours have got grass as well, or there are no corridors for forage around. And there's still some question, and again, I think there are one or two individuals in the audience who probably know more about this than I do, about the influence of forage uh, distribution on populations of bees and their success. And I think that's a really interesting and an important area. So if you are thinking about whether you're part of this project or just doing it out of interest, do think about what it is you're providing for those bees to allow them to be successful. I'm really keen to encourage BID because um, particularly amongst youngsters, we need more young people involved in bee identification. I know there are a lot of people around at the moment, so I'll sort of training and getting that experience but but this is an opportunity to get lab access as well to help with uh, bee identification and I'm sure we in the LNHS will be helping with that and I'm sure there'll be uh, some comments on that a bit later on because I think that's an important part of our, our future work. There will be opportunities to get involved in machine learning, to get involved in the, the mechanics of it for those mathematicians and computer scientists out there and of course field work which we haven't done anything of. This was, a, this was the COVID-19 impact on our work. We expected to at least have looked at the summer bees, um, but we haven't been able to get out and do much because of the restrictions with COVID-19. And with outreach, well, it's all been electronic mostly, and we're hoping to get more involved in that when COVID-19 finally, it doesn't go away because it won't go away, but we can get back out and engage. And of course, I've had offers of collaborations and I've talked to a number of people about how we move this on and I'm still looking for because I, I don't see this as being our project I see it as being a citizen science project to get as many people involved as possible and maybe collaborating through the LNHS to actually bring all of this together and make and also improve the record recording not just of foraging bees but the recording of nest sites as well which I think is important. Uh, particularly in terms of the pressures on uh, suitable habitats for bees uh, being uh, pressured by the need to build and change land use. In terms of help with BID, Rory Diamond produced this last year which went down a storm. It's a great way of starting out looking at spring bees and the spring bees that are coming up are the ones we're going to be focusing on uh, from, from, from early next year, from March onwards. Um, Ignore the, the mining bees. We, as I mentioned before, we tend not to include mining bees in our studies because they are so difficult to attract to a particular site, which is why we're more interested in using uh, bee hotels. But this has some of the common bees, the ones I've mentioned already, like the hairy footed flower bee, which is really a mining bee in a wall. Here's Osmia carolescens, that nice little steely blue bee. Um, the red mason bee, Osmia bicornis. And then the little, the smaller things like uh, Lesia gossam morio, which is quite common as well in our area, certainly around London. Um, so that's a useful little sort of aid memoir, but it's easy to make mistakes from something like that. So the next step up would be to look at the, the classic, the so-called Field Guide to Bees of Great Britain Island by Stephen Falk and illustrated excellently by Richard Lewington. Um, it's not a field guide. It really is a key. Um, the pictures are very good and if you use them with Stephen's um, Flickr collection of photographs it can help but really photographic ID or just looking particularly for some of the more um, uh, uh, um, uh, smaller bees really does require keying out and familiar and first of all and then you've gained familiarity with recognizing these bees and to be honest even I find it quite difficult to, to identify bees in the field sometimes, particularly if they're moving around a lot and difficult to catch and hold in the hand. 
And then also you have the Bee Wars site, the Bees, Wasps and Ants Recording Society, which has an excellent website as well, which will allow you, give you access to some really great information on, on solitary bees, a, a fantastic resource. And there are others too numerous to mention uh, that you can use, but these are the ones that I think are, are really useful. We have a website. Um, <laughs> it took a while to get it set up, but do uh, this is the www.beesinthecityuow for University of Westminster .com. Um, It has a few more links to interesting reference sources that you might be interested in and a contact us bit. So you can contact us through this website. Um, hopefully it's secure. I noticed that was a comment that came up in the chat earlier on. Uh, but do do talk to us um, or if you want us to come and give talks or give talks to your groups uh, we're quite happy to do so so finally some quick acknowledgements obviously the quinton hog trust that's funding the science side of this so it'll be paying for our consumables and also um, some of the hotel work as well so our fabrication work to dane robertson son and uh, the students of the environmental society and it's now um, uh, and my colleagues, Polly Hayes, Adele McCormick and Adej Preno, is it Kale, who have been important on the science side. We have a number of people working in estates to help us start off the uh, work we're doing in, on our, our um, uh, um, uh, campuses. And of course, to our VC Vice Chancellor and President, who's a very keen supporter and will hopefully be encouraging us to actually do a lot of the experimental work over on our Chiswick site as we develop that. And always, always a special thanks to Stephen Falk who, who allowed me to use some of his images of bees because I am not a great photographer, not one of my skill sets. Okay, well, thank you very much for your, your attention. I hope that wasn't too long. Um, are there any questions? Thank you ever so much, Tony. No, that was really interesting. I was fascinated. I, I actually was not even keeping an eye on the time. So <laughs> still, we've got a few minutes left for, for questions. So that's great. And I, I like, I thought, again, that was a really nice wide ranging talk. Um, I, I got a you know, really good insight into that project. And I was interested in just the kind of range of things that were involved. So the fact you had, you were, it was collaboration. It was involving students across the university. Certainly the interest in, you know, kind of getting young people interested and the importance of observing fine detail. I think, you know, that's something that has really wide, re, re, you know, repercussions. If people develop that skill around bees, actually they can take that to other aspects of their learning about the world, which I think is really important. But, uh, and, uh, and interesting as well, the use of artificial intelligence and how that might play a role in kind of tracking and, and surveying and understanding bees. So we'll go on to some questions. The chat's been quite busy. I know I've noticed that. <laughs> dialogue, but there are some, definitely some good questions for you as well. So Anchor, do you want to pick out a couple of questions from the chat now? Yeah, I'll just, I mean, there are quite a few different ones, but um, there are a couple here that I'll, I'll put together. Um, Priscilla was asking about the um, tawny mining bee, and she was worried that it's being ousted by the newer ivy bee. Um, since they both seem to like the same sandy soil. And then um, another um, person, Ernie, um, said he manages a small urban nature reserve and the committee has, has put forward um, the idea of installing hives. And he's worried that the farm bees might have an impact on native species. So I was wondering if you could take those two questions. Uh, two, two very different questions, actually. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, the thing about tawny mining, uh, the, the tawny, it's interesting, ivy bees have exploded this year, I think, I, I don't know what other, others have seen, I haven't seen the data coming in yet. But in our experience in East London, we've seen a huge increase in, in the colony size of um, ivy bees. The one that we looked at on Wonster Flats, for example, covered several hundred square meters. It's huge. Um, do they compete with um, tawny mining bees? No, because tawny mining bees are, are early season, whereas the ivy bees come out late in the season. So the seasonality of bees is really important when you're thinking about competition. So tawny mining bees, Andrina fulva, one of the first mining bees to emerge early in the year. Whereas the ivy bee is the last emerging uh, bee. So they're the ones we've been seeing up until relatively recently. Um, so it's of October time. And they're the ones that literally feed, you know, they're the ones that cover the ivy flowers when they emerge. So I don't you need to worry about that. There's an interesting point, I suppose, about um, 
whether they're nesting in the same sites or not. And often, if you see one bee species nesting in one area, you like to find others as well. And you also tend to find wasps nesting alongside them, but at different times of the year. Um, I don't know if anybody's done it, it's to actually dig up a section of soil and see where how closely interacting those tunnels and, and burrows are. But um, it doesn't seem to cause too much of a problem, but I could imagine at some point it might have an effect. But it's, this is the point of these types of projects. Let's have a look and see what's going on. If we can look and see. I've not seen many records of where tawny mining bees are, for example. We get lots of reports of them foraging, but not where they're actually nesting, which is another, another interesting point. Honeybees. Check with the London Beekeepers Association is the short, if, you're, if it was a London question. Because I think there's some good, good information to be av available from those active beekeeping associations that are thinking about the relationship between forage availability and honeybee populations. If you've got bee honeybees will fly great distances to forage, whereas a lot of the solitary bees only fly relatively short distances. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, and of course, I mean, I know from my experience, you know, I, I often get up early in the morning and I'll see honeybees diving onto our flowers, quickly taking nectar, and then you, you end up with very busy solitary bees following on behind because they're not so good at getting warm first thing in the morning. So solitary bees need to warm up a bit better, whereas honeybees, they're warm in the hive and they're ready to go straight away. So there are all sorts of questions over that. Um, did I see... I think there might be one or two people who could probably answer the question about honeybees better than I can as competition. I've got to be a bit careful what I say. I don't want to upset any beekeepers. That's the only, the only thing, but I'm sure you know where I'm coming from on that. Any other questions? Yep, there are quite a few more. Um, Rory was wondering, um, are there any tips you can give um, in terms, uh, give on in terms of the, what type of substrate to you provide for ground nesting bees in gardens? No, that's an, uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, I, I find it quite quite bizarre because you can be walking along a poached path and there'll be nothing for for meters, and then suddenly there'll be a little concentration of not just bees but burrowing wasps as well, and they're isolated these little pockets of areas. Why they choose and they're they're used year after year after year. They're, they're because there's a lot of loyalty, if you like, to those particular areas. So what is about those substrates? I'm not so sure. It's, there's a balance between the bees have got to be able to burrow into that soil without it collapsing. It mustn't hold too much water so it's too damp, although most bees will line those burrows with a kind of cellophane. Um, and obviously they mustn't get too hot, mustn't be too cold. It's lots and lots of, of aspects to it. Sometimes it's, I find it surprising there are some bees that will nest in very sandy conditions and can actually hold those burrows together. And we have a, a site near us where there's a, a pile of, of not builder's sand, but it's a very fine sand and it's actually full of oxybelis, which is a type of uh, um, a wasp, but also um, a number of other bees as well, smaller bees, the smaller lacioglossums. And yet that's an area that's frequently then dug into and kids play on it and bury these burrows. So it's a very, very dangerous environment for bees. So they, they tend to choose the most inopportune places to make their nests. You may also have noticed that um, paths, and this is a great thing about poached areas around uh, public places, the poached areas, particularly if they're south facing are nice and warm. So you end up with lots and lots of bees and wasps burrowing into that ground. And then the burrows being covered up as people walk over and their dogs play on top of them and, and so on. And you often see bees and wasps hunting around the, the, the area, trying to find where their burrows are. They still find them. It's, it's really, if you've got time to stop and look and you don't mind people wandering around you and trying to walk over you because you're blocking the path, it really is an interesting thing to do. An interesting sort of observational exercise. So sorry, Rory, it doesn't quite answer your question. But again, I think there are one or two individuals who might be in the audience who've actually um, some experience of trying to design and create, I think, apiculture. Mark Patterson's there. I know he's had, uh, had some experience of design or putting together um, uh, uh, substrates suitable for bee burrows. 
So, yeah, that, thank you very much for that. We've got, we've got time probably for a couple more questions. It is possible it's one, we, maybe we could get one question in, if somebody would like to ask a question in person. So do put up your virtual hand and we'll, we'll pick you out if you would like to. But there, there are lots more questions in the chat as well. So Anka, do you want to choose, pick one more out and I'll just see if anyone would like to ask a question in person. Well, okay, there's <laughs> one that isn't particularly scientific perhaps, but I actually want to know the answer to this as well. Linda was wondering how on earth you managed to get a hold of a hairy foot. Oh, get hold of it. That's true, actually. They are so fast. One, a net, and two, finger patience. Um, it's, after a while, it's quite easy to actually pick bees out of nets. I, that's the only way to catch them. Hairy footed flower bees, if, you've, if you're familiar with them, particularly the males, are incredibly energetic. They dart around all over the place and bees are very good at spotting you coming. So they can be a bit of a challenge. But then I, I, I trained myself catching dragonflies. So <laughs> bees are relatively easy by comparison. Anything else? Yeah, have you, have you, have you, and there's no, there's, people are too shy to ask in person, so oh, we'll okay. come on picking a couple more questions out of the chat. So maybe just two more, Anka, and then we'll wind up. Yeah, I mean, I've got some, you know, um, and I think these are quite interesting um, questions, especially for people who um, don't know as much about bees. Um, so there, I'll just ask two of them together. Um, one, um, Ellen was asking about what, is there a function or what function does a honeybee's fuzzy head serve? And Joe was wondering, do all bees buzz? And is this just the sound of their wings vibrating or something else? Eek. <laughs> <laughs> First question, why do, why do honeybees have hairy eyes? Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. Is that, is that embarrassing? Okay, right. Pass over that one very quickly. Why do bees buzz? And why do they make a sound? Do bees actually hear? No, the chances are no, but they may well sense vibrations. Um, it's the sound of the, the thing about bee, and this is what worries me a little bit about using sound. I noticed that Mark has his hand up, by the way, which is great. Um, what's really great is that, or what's, what worries me a little bit about the sound is that as bees age and become more active, the wings start to break up and you often see wings with, uh, bits missing from them as they begin to break down with age and that will change the sound that the bee makes so I'm not sure uh, it's not again it's not an area I've really looked into but we're interested in looking at it for the future that's not an answer sorry <laughs> it's an attempt you... okay so we're, go we're going to go over to Mark now so that's and his will be the final question or comments so yeah uh, uh, you should be unmuted now okay can you all hear yeah, hi. So, um, yeah, just, uh, I've got a question for Charlie, but just in response to the question about why do honeybees have hairy eyes? It's set for, for to be several reasons. So one, one is that it helps them feel and move around and communicate with each other in the darkness of the hive. And it's particularly enables them to sense the other bees that are waggle dancing, which is a form of, form of it's like an interpretive dance that it uses as a form of communication to share um, forage information on, on profitable flower patches. Um, but they also use the heads and eyes. It also helps them with things like um, detecting wind, wind speeds and wind direction and all kinds of things. So it has multiple um, uses, but it's predominantly because they live in, live in a big colony in the darkness and they need to be able to sort of communicate through these dances. So having those hairy eyes helps them, helps them that way. But my question for Tony is I often get asked about um, salty bee hotels particularly the, the, the cavity nesting type hotels for mason bees and things like that. And I'm always getting asked by people, should I be cleaning out the tubes and replacing the tubes? And I always say that when we put a bee space and we put new insulation there, but I'm, I'm not particularly clean, keen on cleaning out the, um, the cocoons and sort of removing all the parasites. Cause I, I think the parasites are often just as rare and just as valuable and with with your study as the bees themselves, I just wondered what your opinion was on people cleaning out bee hotels on an annual basis. I'm kind of with you on that. <laughs> I, I missed part of what you said, but but I, I think it's all part and parcel of the regulation of bee populations. 
when they go up and they go down, they're, you're right. If you think about sapiga, for example, sapigas are not that common. They're quite infrequent. And if you start sort of cleaning out and removing yeah. parasitized uh, uh, nests, you're going to remove that particular population, particularly if they begin to concentrate. And that, that's what worries me as well with bee hotels, is you pull the population, the local parasitoid and parasite population into one area. If you then start cleaning everything out, you wipe out a large number of relatively infrequent yeah. parasites. The flip side to that, of course, is the, the fear that actually you'll go through those boom and bust cycles with parasitism anyway. Yeah. So, no, I, I, it'd be, I think part of the study will be interesting to show whether, what we're seeing in terms of, of, of not just parasites, but viral and bacterial and fungal burden as well. Yeah. And whether we're seeing changes of those within, within bee hotels, because nobody's done the studies. It's all yeah. supposition at the moment. So an evidence base would be really useful, yeah. not just from us, but from anybody else who wants yeah. to do it. Yeah. I suppose if you, if you, if you looked at a, a wild nest, like, like your tree on ones with flats, you know, it would take a while for it to get colonized. You get a big colony of bees there, the population would rise. The parasites would rise as well. Eventually, the, the you know the the tree would decay and collapse. The bees would move elsewhere. The parasites would move elsewhere. So you know if you're not managing your beehives and cleaning them out, you're basically replicating what happens in nature. So I don't think it's an issue. But a lot of the authorities are telling you you should be cleaning them out, and I'm just not quite. I don't don't agree with it. I think I think the other thing is it's also um, comes from using things like osmium bicornis as, as pollinators. So actually move it, moving those those yeah. animals around. And so therefore keeping as many of the cocoons, taking them out, putting them in sheds, making sure that they're, they're ready for the next spring is more of a commercial influence than, than, a, than a real life environmental one. I'm, I'm all for maintaining parasites, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> and they're interesting. Yeah. My, my, yeah, my strategy is to sort of add new fresh Mod, it's fresh sort of um, habitats alongside the decaying habitats. So that is the old habitats are decaying and they become, yes, usefulness. There's new opportunities for them to move in next door. So you've got a succession of sites rather than cleaning them out. I think that's good. Uh, uh, then the question becomes how far apart do you leave them? Because if they're too close, then the, the parasite burden might be very fast. If they're far yeah. away, you know, you may not get the transfer. So it's what is the optimal position for, for moving that? But, but succession planning would be really good. I think that's a good way of moving. From a study point of view, from our study, I think that would be quite hard because that requires us to get more money to do it over a longer period of time, unless we get citizen science projects involved with it. Yeah. So thank if, you. I'm if you want I'm some... Sorry, sorry I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you because we are kind of like needed to come to a close. Is there a way that people can get in touch with you, Tony? Because obviously there's, you know, we started some dialogues and there's still quite a lot of questions. Is there a way of people contact you to... Yeah, if, if, so the first thing is there's my email address, which I can put in the chat box or some... And it's somebody who... I know some of my colleagues are in the um, audience somewhere. If they can type the... Um, that's it. Dane's done it already. Oh, that's great. Thank so Dane's you. put in the, the uh, sorry, so I'm, just, I'm just trying to get out of the, that's it. Everyone in the meeting. I'm just about to put my email in. That's really kind. Thanks very much. So, you know, so people do feel free that you can kind of get in touch because I think it's right, you know, we've raised a lot of questions and it's, you know, it'd be nice to kind of for people to be able to follow up on well, some of these. What I, what I can do, if you can make sure I'll save the chat, the, the chat, that will have lots of questions in it. And what I'll do is we'll we'll answer those questions if we can in our blog um so if you make sure that you find the um uh make a note of the so i'm trying to type and think at the same time if you um go to the university of westminster bees in the city site um then you'll be able to i'll be able to to feed back to you there and i think dane has also mentioned our slack um which is a bit like whatsapp um, which is a, a means of actually communicating. We use that for communicating with students, to be honest, but it's great for communicating with everybody else because it doesn't involve your phone number. It's just your email address that you put in. So Slack's a really good way of, of communicating in, in, in a social yeah. environment. Oh, that's great. Well, that's a new bit of, uh, I didn't, I've never used that before. So that's something new to kind of experiment with. But thank you so much for a really fantastic talk, which is, you know, really provoked a lot of interest and a lot of enthusiasm. And the chat and the kind of questions at the end have really shown how people have engaged with it so well.
thank you again for well thank <laughs> thank you to everybody else. I, i've seen lots of people so if you do want do get in touch with me particularly about sites so we can record those sites and we can actually perhaps come and visit when covid19 has died down a bit and get involved in some dialogue get people involved in the project It'd be fantastic yeah. and fingers